Okay, hello everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Destiny Dunbar and I am the Community Engagement Specialist here at Resources for Sustainable Communities. Um, and we're super excited to be having Victoria Sues joining us from the Watka Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Um, this is one of several webinars that's being put on by resources and the Watka Marine Resources Committee um, for our North Sound Stewards programs. So if you are one of our scientists, make sure that you do log this in your hours. Um, we're gonna be going until 6 p.m. and um, we'll save the first part of the presentation um, for Troy to do her presentation. And then afterwards, we will go ahead and take questions. So we'll ask that if you're not already muted, which it looks like everybody is, just go ahead and keep yourselves muted um and your video is turned off and then at the end you can either um, type your questions into the chat as she's going through the presentation or at the end you can turn on your mic and your video and we can do questions that way so i'm going to go ahead and read victoria's bio and then we will get started one moment go ahead and Okay, so Victoria Suze is the principal investigator for the Watka Marine Mammal Stranding Network. She's been with the network since its inception in 2007. The network responds to all calls about marine mammals in distress or deceased. Um, if deceased, um, ne necro necropsies are performed yeah. to determine the cause of death. Victoria and other volunteers with the network have recently launched a program that is taking a curriculum into primary and middle schools in Whatcom County. This program is to educate the classroom about mam uh, marine mammals of the Salish Sea and the hazards they face from pollution to human interaction. She is passionate about marine mammals and has been working as a marine naturalist for 24 years. Her work takes her from the San Juan Islands to Alaska. She takes people out for beach walks, bird walking, and viewing marine wildlife. She currently works for the San Juan Cruises and the Lindblad, Lindblad and National Geographic Cruises. Um, she's lived on the West Coast from California to Alaska and Hawaii, and she's been a resident of Lummi Island for the past 24 years with a background in marine biology. So that is Victoria, and you can go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Destiny. All right. Yes, um, I'm just going to jump right in here. Uh, so pretty much that explained what the Waka Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Um, we uh, a lot of people now are really getting to know who we are and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we do and um, I'm going to key point some of the key species that we deal with so let's uh, uh -huh. so we work with NOAA we um, because marine mammals are a protected species we uh, have a, an LOA, which is a letter of authorization. And without that letter of authorization or without working with NOAA, you are not supposed to be I am within 100 yards of any marine mammal, whether they're dead or alive. So the Marine Mammal Protection Act was instated in 1972. Up until that time, marine mammals didn't have any protection. They could be shot. And as a matter of fact, there was a bounty on harbor seals up until 1964 in the state of Washington, as well as in British Columbia. And I'm going to show this um, short video. It's what we've made. We have it on our website, but it really explains a lot of, of what we do in the summer, which is seal sitting. And you say, what is seal sitting? Well, this will explain it. Victoria, we're not able to hear any audio. Maybe if you um, you can't hear it. Yeah, there's okay. no. There's, yeah, no there's no. There's no. There's no volume. Um, there's no volume. Maybe if you turn up the volume on your. Um, okay. I did turn up the volume all the way. So try it now, and if not, we can skip this. Anything? Um, it's still pretty. If that's what I'm hearing, I think it's really faint. If that's as high as we can go, then we can go ahead and skip this. And then if you want, yeah. you can actually um, post the yeah. link to this video in the chat and we can be okay. that way. Um, 
Well, I'll just say the video is on our website. So, and I'll talk about our website at the end. Um, I have Zoom, I have a problem with the audio sometimes. Zoom is not made, it's, it's hard to work with audio. So let's just go on. We'll start with uh, minke whales. They are around here. We see them off of the west side of Lummi Island in Rosario Strait. They like deeper water. They're not very acrobatic, um, but they are throughout the San Juan Islands. They come here and they spend the summer here. And in the wintertime, they go down to further southern climates. Not a lot is known about them. They're kind of elusive and they're solitary. They're the smallest of the baleen whales. They're only about 30 feet long. And since they don't jump up out of the water and do a lot of things, this is basically about the only thing that you'll see of them is uh, in all my years of whale watching, I've only seen one minke whale come out of the water in what we call a breach. And I've been out there thousands of times. But uh, so that's basically what you see. They have a very small dorsal fin. They are around here, but um, unless you really are looking for them, it's really, you just don't see them. Um, we, we, this is kind of exciting because we now have humpback whales. They were really severely endangered. And in, this, uh, in some areas, they've actually been taken off the Endangered Species Act listing. And we have quite a few of them that come into the Salish Sea and they, they're spending the summer here, which means that they have enough food and uh, they can spend the summer here rather than going all the way up into Alaska because their population is so big and they actually, they're ID'd, we have nicknames for them and we see them out there all the time now. It's really exciting. I, I consider them the ambassadors for the in the marine mammal world because it was back in the 1970s, people really didn't think much about um, marine mammals. However, the marine biologists started recording their songs over in Hawaii. That's when they do all of their singing is in their breeding grounds in Hawaii. And they also in uh, Mexico and Central America, but it was in Hawaii where they started recording their songs and they really became the ambassador for, for marine mammals and really brought a whole awareness to the whole world about marine mammals that wasn't there before. We have all of them ID'd. There's a catalog with thousands of them and how we ID them is by their tail flukes. Every tail fluke is individual to each whale and so some of these whales have been ID'd from way back into the 80s and we've seen them have successions of calves. They probably live to be about 60 to 70 years of age. And as you can see, a lot of what you see of humpbacks' tails are like this. It's really hard to get a really good ID shot, but um, there's a lot of researchers and that's, they spend hours and hours out there doing this. They are baleen whales, so that means that they eat small krill and small bait fish. A bait fish is pretty much any kind of herring, sand lance, any kind of small fish that groups up in a school and they just come up from the bottom or from the deeper water, and they open their mouth, and that lower jaw, which you see in the picture here, actually fills up with hundreds of gallons of water, and then they uh, close the upper jaw, and then that baleen, they squirt all of the water out through the baleen, and then they have all of the food left behind. And yes, you see a lot of gulls here, and yes, the gulls occasionally do get trapped in the mouth. They generally survive it, but I have seen where they didn't too. This was back in 2012. It was right across the border. Um, it was right up just south of White Rock, in between White Rock and the U.S. border. And it was a humpback whale that had been swimming around entangled in fishing gear. They figure probably at least for about six months, it literally starved to death and it washed up dead. This was back in 2012. I don't know if any of you would remember this or not, or if you keep up with strandings. Um, a stranding, it is any marine mammal that comes into a beach or an area, whether it's alive or dead, and it can't get back to its ocean marine environment. Uh, one of the problems that humpback whales are now seeing because of the increase in population of humpback whales is that they are becoming entangled. They're becoming entangled in a lot of crab pot gear. We've actually seen humpback whales all the way up in Alaska with crab gear that they've drug all the way up there from California. 
And what it does, as you can see from this picture here, I know it's not very pleasant, but it's, it's what happens, is it gets wrapped around their tail flukes and eventually it can actually cut their tail off, which is pretty much fatal. Uh, this is just, uh, I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but the, the, red, the red parts are the um, entanglements of humpbacks. The gray whales, which we'll talk about next, are the blue. And as you can see, going from <coughs> far left, 1994, you'll just see that there was very few here in Washington and Oregon. <coughs> and look at the number, uh, if you go to the far right, uh, what's going on in 2018. So we are seeing a lot more entanglements. Uh, last year, the California Dungeness crab fishery, which is a multi-billion dollar industry, had to, uh, it closed early. Um, they weren't happy about it, but they were also getting um, turtle entanglements also. So this is, this. Uh, I really am excited about this and a lot of work is being done on the East Coast. Um, if you're familiar, lobster, lobster pots are pretty much like Dungeness gear, crab pots. They have a pot at the bottom with a, with a line that goes up to the top. This is a pot that does not have a lawn. It's, it's actually one of our volunteer responders designed this. And so it works with remote control. That bag fills up and it comes to the surface. There's no lines involved and we would really like to see this take off. Uh, at the coastal studies back in Massachusetts, it's becoming a really big thing. They're really working with it and trying to get it into the lobster industry back there. And hopefully we'll see it maybe within the next decade out here on the West Coast. Uh, the next one I would like to talk about is gray whales. And gray whales, once again, they, their numbers have increased. They were taken off the Endangered Species Act in 1998. And so we see them coming by here in the spring and they're, they're becoming, we get sightings here in Bellingham Bay, Semiamu, uh, Birch Bay, Blaine area. They've actually, um, somebody texted me last night and they've got a gray whale out there in Birch Bay that's been there for the last week. Uh, they have one of the longest migrations and you can see that the migration of the humpback whale here is in red and of the gray whales it's in yellow. So you see with the red line that it goes from Hawaii up to Alaska and it also goes from Central America up to Alaska and it, they also stop at British Columbia and Washington now. Um, but uh, that's the difference between the humpback whales and the gray whales. The gray whales are in the yellow. So this is uh, gray whales, they, they come down and this is where they give birth is down in Baja. There's little secluded coves in there where they give birth to their calves. And uh, then they go up um, and they, some of them go all the way up into the Arctic to feed for the summer. And then they come back down and spend the winters back down in Baja. But they come by here and on their way here, they, uh, some, some of them stop in to a place right just off the edge of Whidbey Island, the south end of Whidbey Island. So they kind of come, they're coming up the coast there. And as you see from the red line, they're going 70 miles out of their way. This, the first um, sightings of these, we, we call them the sounders. There's about 12 whales that come in there every year. And we call them the sounders. And somehow back in 1999, one of these gray whales made a detour, went 70 miles off the migration and went to this little mud flat area off of Wood Whidbey, in between Whidbey and Muckleteal. And they spend, she spent two months there and then left. The next year she came back with another gray whale. And so those gray whales have turned into about 12 of them that come there. They arrive in fe late February, early March, and some of them stay until late April or the early May. And then they take off and we assume that they go up to the Arctic or, or further northern climbs to, climates to uh, finish up their migration and feed and before they head back south to Baja. It's just kind of an interesting aside though in um, 21 years what this has turned into. So there is a small endangered, uh, our, our gray whales here on the eastern Pacific coast, which is where we live, are not endangered. As I said before, they were taken off the Endangered Species Act listing in 98. 
but there's a small population over off the Sakhalin Islands, and there's only 120 gray whales in this. Uh, and we thought that they had nothing to do with the Eastern Pacific whales. However, back in 2005, they tagged one, and when the tag fell off, it was over in Oregon. And then in 2012, they tagged another one, and she actually came all the way over, and her tag was lost in uh, Northern California. So these, this small population of 120 gray whales actually does cross the Gulf of Alaska and come over to the Eastern Pacific. We don't know much more about them, but we've always, up until the first tagging in 2005, and then again in 2012, we thought they were a totally separate population, but evidently they're not. So we, last year in May of 2019, the NOAA declared a UME. A UME is an unusual mortality event. And the last time we had a UME with gray whales was in 1999. And so what happens with an unusual mortality event is that we see a lot of whales wash up dead or dying, and they die once they strand. Uh, in last year, there was 215 gray whales that stranded on the West Coast. This is probably only 10% of the population that died because the rest probably just sank at sea. And now in 2020, the UME is not so severe. Only 125 gray whales have stranded on the West Coast so far. Uh, we'll see that number will probably go up before the month of June is out because they're still migrating up. Uh, what we saw back in the winter of 2019, when the whales arrived back down to Baja for their wintering in 2018-2019, that winter, is 60% of the population was emaciated and the calving was down one-fourth to a half. So they obviously were not getting enough food up in the Arctic where they were feeding. Um, we do not have any clear scientific data on why this could be. It could be very well attributed to climate change. Um, back in 2017, one of these sounders that comes up to uh, the Whidbey Island area, uh, there was uh, five or six whale watching boats and they were all surrounding this particular whale. And they watched this small pleasure boat going right through the middle of the whale watch boats who were all at their 100 yard distance. So that the boat was going 30, 35 miles an hour and it hit this whale, actually went airborne when it hit it. So it's so important if you were a boater to be aware of whales out there. And if you do see whale watching boats around, they're, they're sitting there in the water because they're watching a whale. So if you are a boater and you do get out and you see a whale watching boat, please, be careful. Um, fortunately, this whale was not hurt. Um, we here in Whatcom County, we get a stranded dead whale probably every three to four years. This was one that died in Bellingham Bay or floated into Bellingham Bay. Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife um, towed it over to a remote place of uh, DNR land on Lummi Island and once we had it towed there we secured it and then we did a necropsy on it and basically when we do a necropsy on a gray whale Cascadia research from Olympia comes up they assist us and we take blubber samples all the organ samples and uh, if we can we try and get the earwax out of the ear canal the earwax gets sent to Baylor University. We've done this a lot with harbor porpoise and also with this particular gray whale. And down at Baylor University is in Texas. And what they do with the earwax is the earwax is laid down in increments every six months from birth. So they could actually tell for this, this whale, they knew, well, we knew she was a female. They knew that um, from the earwax, they knew that she had had seven calves. They knew that she was 40 years of age, and they could also tell from the earwax any seasons that she might have been stressed by the hormones, and stressed probably from uh, food-wise is the type of stress that I'm talking about. So it's really fascinating. So this is the kind of thing that we find out when we do necropsies. A necropsy, if you're not familiar with the term, is just what you, uh, you refer to it as an aut autopsy when it's done on humans. When you're doing it on an animal, it's called a necropsy. 
Uh, so this is another gray whale. Uh, this was two years prior to that one. This was in 26, 2015. Um, so the next little cetacean, by the way, a cetacean, if you're not familiar with that term, a cetacean is any type of whale, dolphin, or porpoise. Uh, we have these dolls porpoise. They're about six, seven feet long. They weigh about 350 pounds. And as you can see, they kind of look like baby orcas. So one of the things that if we do get one of these stranding dead up on the shoreline and somebody comes across, we might get a phone call that says, oh, there's a dead baby orca, which of course, if any of you know about our southern um in southern resident fish eating orcas how endangered they are you know that's really it just causes panic but the big difference is there's no white eye patch there's a baby orca up there or an orca see the white eye patch right above its eye dolls porpoise are much smaller than orcas and they don't have a white eye patch these little um porpoises we only have two porpoise in in the salish sea harbor porpoise and dolls porpoise there's only six porpoise in the entire world. So uh, these little porpoise, though, are some of the fastest. They can go up to speeds of almost 35 miles an hour. Harbor porpoise are what is much more common. There's, you'll see if you live in Bellingham, just and if you, spend, you get a chance to go out on, on Bellingham Bay, they are all over Bellingham. I would be surprised if you spent a couple of hours on the water in Bellingham Bay and did not see harbor porpoise. Right now is calving time, and they're giving birth to a small two to three foot porpoise. And that little porpoise, the baby, has what we call fetal folds. And it has these fetal folds for a few hours to up to two days. They give birth to a calf every one to two years. The female sexually matures between six and eight years of age. Uh, they're also very common in Birch Bay. If you or live up in that area, walk down to um, Birch Bay at the park there and just take take a look. You don't, probably don't even need binoculars. Look for, for a little glint of sunlight and a little, they don't jump out of the water and do anything acrobatic. And they usually travel in small numbers of say two to three. This is what they look like underneath the water. Um, we had a live stranding here last year on Lummi Island. Uh, the people who called us, they didn't know who to call. They were from out of town and they were staying at a vacation rental, unfortunately. They kept um, Googling uh, dolphin. So we don't really have dolphins that live here in our area. So they kept getting all of these stranding networks that were on the East Coast where dolphin strandings are common. So by the time they finally did get old of us, I got there as she was taking her last breaths. So we did a full necropsy on her. Uh, this is an interesting porpoise. Um, it's a hybrid. And we, uh, the, what happens is the doll's porpoise and the harbor porpoise, they hybridize. And uh, it's not super common, but we, we've seen quite a few of these. Not dead stranded like this one was, but um, it's a lot beefier than a regular harbor porpoise. The coloring is a little bit different. The head shape is a little bit different. And so it, it was a hybrid between a doll's and a harbor porpoise. This porpoise washed up dead on the Lummi Reservation five years ago. And this is probably the most common, it is the, the most common marine mammal, and it's the one that we deal with the most. And these are harbor seals. They, at maturity, they get to be about five or six feet, um, around two to 300 pounds. The males are larger than the females. In the springtime, the females congregate onto haul outs which are rocks like this, and we call them haul outs, then they, they congregate together, and this is where they give birth to their pups. They give birth to one pup, and right now is pupping season, and this is one of our busiest times for us, because uh, the mom will go out foraging, and she might leave that pup, especially up in the Semiamu and Birch Bay area. Uh, she might leave that pup and leave it on the beach, and people come along, and they think the pup is abandoned. If they don't leave that pup alone, mom won't come back because what mom sees from the water is she sees humans or dogs surrounding her pup. She doesn't have any way to defend that pup and eventually she'll give up and go away. Then that pup becomes orphaned and abandoned. 
And that's where we do step in if this happens, especially if it's from human interaction. Unfortunately, mortality is high with harbor seals, but if there's human interaction, then that's where we step in and we, we intervene. And if you go to our website, that little three minute video is there and it explains a lot about our seal sitting. What do we do when we get a seal pup? Uh, say we have one up at Semiamu in front of the resort. Well, I call on my volunteers. I've got 60 plus volunteers and I call up, see who's available to be a volunteer. You don't have to be on 24 seven like I am, but, um, and then if whoever is available, we just sort of make shifts and we all take shifts anywhere from two to four hours. We put yellow tape around that seal pup and then we seal sit to try and keep the public away. And generally, if we can keep the public away and nightfall comes, mom will come back and get that pup if she feels it's safe to do so. Uh, this is up in Semiamu. There's a little pup with its mom, two pups with, their, with its mom. Uh, mom finds her pup by smell. They, they, they form a bond. Just baby pictures. I love baby pictures of anything. So, uh, right, we just finished up with May. Unfortunately, in May, we get these, what we call a Lanugo pup. A Lanugo pup is a pup that is born prematurely. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's got a really fluffy white coat. Its coat isn't quite formed yet. Oftentimes these Lanugos, they're, al they're alive, but mom will abandon them. And they're not a candidate for rehab because usually they, they, uh, their lungs aren't formed right or anything else. What we will do with a Lanugo pup is we will humanely euthanize it up at the Wildlife Center. We have a partnership with the Whatcom Humane Societies Wildlife Center, which is up by Nugent's Corner there. And we actually have, this is a, this is a half Lanugo pup. You can see his head is formed, his rear flippers are formed, but the other part of him wasn't formed. We actually were given permission to send him to a full rehab over at Wolf Hollow in Friday Harbor. Because of the circumstances, um, some people on the reservation actually had video of this because they had a camera outside of their house. They were fish sellers. And somebody took this pup and they had pictures of him being abandoned in their backyard in the middle of the night for whatever reason. We have no idea. What people do when they come across these pups is kind of bizarre. But anyway, so because of the circumstances of this pup and there was no way to reunite it with mom and he was too small to relocate to a safe spot, we were actually sent him over to Wolf Hollow for a full rehab. Uh, this is a harbor seal and she had fishing wire. This is down in Squalicum Harbor in Bellingham. She had fishing wire wrapped around her neck and through her mouth. We tried to set up uh, with nets and that. We tried to capture. We never could capture her. Uh, we had sightings of her for about four days in the harbor and then we, we lost sightings of her. I assume she died because that fishing line was cutting into her neck. So these are the kind of things we deal with. If we could have caught her, we could have disentangled her uh, and hopefully just uh, turned her loose and she would have been fine. Probably wouldn't have needed any medical checkup or uh, and medical needs after that. This is, I said earlier, we have, um, we're, we have a partnership with the Whatcom Humane Society's uh, Wildlife Center. And four years ago, we built this seal pup triage center. And we have a NOAA permit. We can keep pups for 24 hours here. And oftentimes, if we get a pup that is close to being weaned, um, the female harbor seal only nurses her pups four to six weeks, which is a very short time. So if that pup is getting close to being of a weaned age, and we know that, and especially if it has fish scales in its feces, we'll take the pup, we'll keep it overnight, we'll rehydrate it, any medical attention it needs, and then we will relocate it to a better place where it won't have human interaction. So these are just some pups that we had in our care. Two of those came from Lummi Island, one came from Birch Bay. This is a pup, this pup was picked up in the Ballard by the Ballard Locks. Some people were fishing, the pup was crying, it kept jumping up onto their swim fin of their boat, so they picked it up, put it in their boat with them, and they brought it all the way back up to Bellingham where they dropped it off at the Marine Science, Marine Life Center at Squalicum Harbor. They called us and we came and got it. 
It still had the umbilicus on it. Um, it lost an eye due to injury on the transport up here on the deck of their boat. It should never have happened. This one was sent to Wolf Hollow for a full rehab rehabilitation because it had the umbilicus. It was still a nursing pup and could not have been taken care of and then relocated out to a safe spot. So it was a candidate for a full rehab. Full rehab with a harbor seal pup takes about three to four months. This particular harbor seal, this one was picked up in um, Anacortes at a boat marina. The, this, uh, the mother of this pup has for like five years been giving birth every year to a pup at this marina. And uh, the people always watch, watch for it and they watch out for it. Well, this man here, he decided the pup was crying. And so he picked it up and he brought it home and he fed it half and half cream. And uh, he called us up and we said, please don't feed it anymore. Please, we, we're gonna pick it up. We want it to, uh, and he wouldn't tell us where he lived. By the time we find, he finally did tell us where he lived, which was later in the day when he called we went and got it and it died because they have a very, um, it's their diet is, they're, they're not made for half and half. When we have them in rehab, they get like a fish milkshake. So it basically died from blocked intestines. This was down in Squalicum Harbor and it's a lot of blood on the dock. Uh, somebody called us and we got down there and we just said, hey, can you just not go to your sailboat for a couple of hours? Mom had just given birth. That's her little pup there. All they needed was an hour on the dock and then she took off and swam away. Pup swam away with her and it was a great success. So it's always nice when people cooperate with us like this and we just tell them, give them some room. Um, we, if you're familiar with Point um, Migley, it's on the northwest tip of Lummi Island. We have these rocks out here. And 300 seal pups are born here every year. We get about 300 mother seals that congregate here. They start in May and they stay here all throughout the entire summer until September. But it's uh, very close to the shoreline and it's a favorite with kayakers. They just can't seem to stay off of these rocks. Even though you're not supposed to go near a seal haul out, they're protected. This is the kind of things that we deal with. Kayakers getting too close, what happens? If you see in the background of that picture, all of what looks like um, floating kelp or something, those are all seal pups and their moms. They've all left the rock and scattered. What happens here is the seal pups get, um, they, they get caught in the current um, and then they get, uh, they, they wind up out on the, on the beach, which is just 100 yards in. They can't get uh, reunited back with mom. And then once again, we have an orphaned seal pup. And uh, if we can, we take it back out to the rocks. It depends what kind of shape it's in. If it's been on the beach for a couple of days without mom's care, they're usually very dehydrated. It depends how old it is. There's a lot of different factors, but we try and relocate it back out to this place. We don't always know that these pups come from here. Uh, this is the same rocks. And here you can see somebody's decided one beautiful summer day to plant a flag there. It was Canada Day. They went out and planted, they also brought their dogs. The dogs are running all over on the rocks. Kayaks, dogs. Um, we wound up rescuing two seal pups after this episode. And these were the two seal pups. Uh, so at the time we took them back to our seal pup triage center. We kept them overnight. We rehydrated them and then we relocated them back to the rock. They were just old enough. They didn't have an umbilicus. They had some fish scales in their feces. So we hope that they made it. Uh, this is just relocation. We do, we do it by boat. We have volunteers who were very, um, who help us out with that. We don't have our own boat. This was an interesting call. It was uh, five years ago, but it's beautiful, isn't it? It's called a ribbon seal. They live up above the Arctic Circle. Well, this was one of those rare snowy days in Bellingham. This is down in Fairhaven. We get a phone call and they said there's this really, uh, there's a ribbon seal. The person knew what it was and we said, oh, no way. And they sent us this picture. Well, we went down and sure enough, it was a ribbon seal. It was doing fine. It disappeared. It went down to Everett. It was sighted down in Everett. And then after that, it wasn't sighted again. But two years later on Long Beach, Washington, another ribbon seal showed up on the beach down there. And like I said, these, these particular seals, they live above the Arctic Circle. That's way, way out of their range. 
Elephant seals, we do have them around here, uh, but we don't, the only place that uh, the males can get to be about 4,000 pounds. And if you go boating out in the Salish Sea, you might see it. It looks like a deadhead, like just a log stick sticking up and then they'll go back under the water. We only have one case of, um, this, this female has given birth twice now in the last four years, right in front of these houses on Whidbey Island. And so Central Puget Sound Stranding Network, they have to tape it off regularly. And while it, once again, they only nurse for four to six weeks and uh, mom then will wean the pup. So she's, this is probably the first elephant seal born in our area in a hundred years. Elephant seals are slowly coming back from being endangered. They're still endangered, but uh, they were almost extinct. They were hunted to extinction up until 1910. They left like six elephant seals alive on race rocks outside of Victoria back in 1910. Um, so the way to tell the difference between an elephant seal and a harbor seal is a harbor seal has white whiskers, elephant seal has black. Other than that, they look very similar. Uh, stellars, these are, that's a juvenile stellar along with a male and a female. This was taken off of Point Roberts. We don't generally see females or, or juvenile stellars in our area. We see them um, out on the outer coast or we see them up in um, British Columbia and Alaska. So this was kind of unusual. Uh, stellars are making a comeback from being hunted to the brink of extinction. So we have seen uh, calves over off of a little island off of Saturna, which is in um, just across the border. Uh, so they're making a comeback and possibly we might get what we call a rookery where the females might start here coming back and giving birth to pups. California sea lions, we get those, but they're not as common here. Uh, the, the California sea lion is on the left. Uh, they have on the stellar sea lions are on the right. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell them apart, but um, if you looked at several different pictures, I'm, uh, you would be able to tell them. Uh, this is just a picture of stellar sea lions. This um, was taken off of Susha Island. There's a little reef out there called Clements Reef. This is at a high tide. At a low tide, this reef is very exposed. But as you can see, these are harbor seals. They look like rocks. We call them rock sausages. This is where they get their name from. And those are 2,000 pound stellars. So they do live in harmony. Uh, they, they, uh, they will share the same hull out. And this is a real common hull out where both of these species share it. And one of the biggest phone calls we get for sea lions is right, this is what's called rafting. And if you look at this, it looks like it might be in distress. What they're doing is they're thermoregulating. This is a California sea lion. It's got its flippers up in the air. It's thermoregulating. It's perfectly natural. And we get a lot of calls like that. People are sure that they're entangled. We, we answer every single call. And uh, we go out there and then we have to explain to people, it's just rafting, it's totally fine. And they say, but it's been in this like that for two to three hours. And we go, yeah, that's normal, that, that happens. But we would much rather have a call than not. This was a stellar sea lion in Point Roberts. It had been shot, this was five years ago. One of the big, big things that we do have with both California and stellar sea lions and harbor seals is they are shot. They're shot by fishermen because they are considered uh, competition because they do like to eat salmon. Uh, and the fishermen, that's what they're going after. So they will shoot them. It is highly illegal. What we do is we'll take the, they'll cut the head off, take, take the head to the x-ray at the wildlife center and retrieve the bullet. We turn it over to NOAA enforcement. Um, this was a California sea lion in Point Roberts. It had fishing line all wrapped around its neck. The, there's not much we can do about an animal that is in the water. Or my, my thought at the time was if it went across the border, then the Vancouver Aquarium where they have the equipment and they have vets and they've got boats and all kinds of things that we don't have here to deal with. If it was just across the border, they could be on it and they could get that, give it a little cocktail that would um, make it go out, but not out enough to where uh, it'll drown. The problem is if you give a sea lion or a seal, if you try to give them a dart with anesthesia on it, 
is they jump in the water and they drown. But up in Vancouver, they have developed what we call like a cocktail where they can shoot it with this, with this type of anesthesia. It doesn't put it totally out and it can still, it can't quite swim, but it can still stay enough up to breathe. And then they can get alongside it with their boat, cut the uh, entanglement out of it, and then they can give it a counter cocktail to bring it back. If we do have a dead animal that we're going to leave on the shore, which normally we will leave if it's in a remote area, we will leave them to uh, let the uh, eagles or whatever other predators, we'll give it a nice green paint. This is um, non-toxic life, livestock paint. We'll also give this to live seal pups that were seal sitting so that we can tell them the next day if it's the same pup. So if you come across a dead animal and you see that this green paint, no, nobody has been um, trying to put graffiti on a dead animal, it's just us. We're marking that animal so that if we get several phone calls about it, we can say, yes, we're aware of it. We already went and we examined it and we've got all the data that we needed off of it. Uh, this was in 2018. This, we, it wasn't our stranding network that dealt with it, but this, I talked about them being shot. She was shot, uh, she lost her eyes, turned out she was pregnant. And um, anyway, she was successfully uh, rehabbed and released. She was shot during a fishing derby while they were salmon fishing. Uh, this is what uh, marine mammals are dealing with. Everything that we do, as I'm sure you all know, winds up in the water. So harbor seals, sea lions, orcas, porpoise, this is everything that happens. And of course, you probably are aware of our orcas and um, one of the biggest things is lack of salmon for them. And I, 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 I can't go into that. It would take a, an hour to talk about that. But another thing that's happening with them, with our Southern resident orcas, uh, we have two communities of orcas that live here. The Biggs killer whales, also known as transients, they're doing great. Their numbers are increasing 4% a year. Whereas our Southern resident fish eating whales, they are, numbers are going way down. They're down to 74. Uh, and uh, this is one, just a little pictorial showing you the bioaccumulation. It starts with the plankton at the bottom, goes to the small bait fish, to the salmon. And by the time it gets up into the orcas, this is what they are bioaccumulating. Most of these toxins are fat soluble, means that they gets into their fat layer. No problem. But when they are starving from lack of salmon, then these toxins are immediately released from their blubber layer into their bloodstream. And of course, garbage. And as we probably all of us who are right now on this, on this conference, uh, we all probably are very well aware of garbage and plastic and probably all do all of our part. So I don't think I need to go into that too much. Uh, sea otters, river otters, are, we don't consider river otters a marine mammal. However, I will rescue them and I will take them up to the wildlife center if needed. A sea otter is a marine mammal. We don't have many sightings here. Uh, they're on the outer coast and they're also up in British Columbia, Alaska, but uh, we never did have a population of sea otters in here, even historically. So we do a lot of education with kids. We like to hit, well, we like to go to all, any event that we can and we have skulls, we have a stuffed harbor seal. We love to interact with the public to educate. Uh, we have oil spill response training. It's only a matter of time. We've got four refineries in our area. Um, I'm trained 24 hour Hazwopper. There's 12 of us. We got 15 of our responders are trained with eight hour Hazwopper training specifically to deal with oiled, um, with oiled marine mammals. Uh, so we are on the ready if need be. And everybody that I've trained with throughout the years the people who do oil spills for a living and go worldwide doing them say it's not a matter of if for you, it's a matter of when. As I'm going to finish up here is, as you all know, with the COVID, mainly we totally, to keep our seal pup triage center going to buy um, well, equipment for our volunteer to safely respond and that uh, we totally rely on fundraising and donations. 
and we had to stop all of our fundraising this year because of the COVID. And it doesn't look like we're gonna be doing anything for the rest of the year probably that we normally would be doing such as silent auctions and dinners. If you would like to donate, you can go to our website. We have a PayPal button. And if you don't like to use PayPal, you can always contact me. I could tell you how to donate. So any questions? Hey, thank you so much, Victoria. That was awesome. That was so like fascinating. I feel like I learned a lot. Um, we do have one question here from Eva, and that is our Lanugo hey, pups. Yeah, our Lanugo pups common. What causes their pre-birth and harbor seals? We don't know. It's but they are. They are. They can be quite common. We had three Lanugo pups, and those are just the ones that we know of that we got to. Um, and they were still alive. We uh, generally like to wait 24 hours to make sure that mom's not coming back for them. But we generally get anywhere from three to five Lanugo pups in the month of May. We don't exactly know why they're born prematurely. It's just something that happens. The one great thing about partnering with the Wildlife Center is that the manager there, Alicia Evans, is she can euthanize. So. Whereas previously we had no way to deal with them um, other than let nature take its course, which can take up to days at a time. We were, we're lucky that I can now take these pups up to be humanely euthanized. Oh, it looks uh, like, yeah. yeah. Can you unmute yourself? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, something weird was going on with the sound. Um, I was wondering, so with um, North Sound Stewards, we do a lot of activities out on the beach. Um, I guess it's fortunate we've never come across any um, like seal pups or marine mammals in distress. Unfortunately, we have come across a few that are already deceased. Um, do you have any best recommendations for what we should do? It sounds like we should just leave them be. Oh, what, oh definitely. What, what, what you should do is call us. Okay. It doesn't, even if it's half decomposed and almost gone, we go and we collect data on that. And that goes into a national database that NOAA keeps with all of the stranding networks along the whole entire coast. So we do have a national database. And so we like to keep records of all, all marine mammals, even, like I said, even if it's decomposed, or whatever. And generally, we get a lot of phone calls that somebody took the head off of a seal or a sea lion. Um, the head is the first thing to be eaten from the crabs and everything else. So um, a headless seal, sea lion, yes, a porpoise, we, we want to be called, I'll get a responder out there to collect the data that we want to put into the database. I had a question. I'm wondering what is, um, what is your protocol for dealing with really large animals that haven't, uh, they're not deceased yet, but they might be stranded, but they're like really big. What do you Like a stellar sea lion or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, what we, we don't, um, we, if we can, it's euthanization, euthanize. But the problem with that is once we euthanize it, if it's a really big animal, we can't leave it on the beach for predators. Say it's like a 1500 pound stellar sea lion. And so we don't have any way to take it off the beach. And it's once it gets a euthani euthanasia in it, you know, it's, it's deadly to any animals that might predate on it, birds or whatever. So unfortunately, what uh, we will do is um, if it looks like it, there's no chance to help it or we can't get somebody to help us with it, it and it's too far gone, uh, we will have the fish and wildlife. They, we work with them a lot too and they'll shoot it, humanely shoot it, uh, and then we'll do a necropsy on it. So a lot of what we do is not really that pleasant, but it's just it's, we're dealing with the animals and that's what happens. Of course, the seal pups and the, and the great little stories that we have of the releases and how happy they are and that, that's always the best thing that happens all summer. 
Looks like we have another question from Ivana with the C Discovery Center in Paulsbo. We teach our kids the difference between biomagnification and bioaccumulation. Is this uh, heavily yeah. talked about in your outreach with schools up in Whatcom as well? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and then also from Candice, um, is there a need for more folks to be trained in oil spill response? If so, how do we find out more about it? I am also very curious with the oil spill response. Ah, good question. Okay. Um, there, uh, there was some trainings going on this spring, and we were also going to give a responder training to become a volunteer with us, but of course all of that got canceled. Uh, right now, IOSA, it's capital I-O-S-A, they're in the San, Juan's, San Juan Islands. IOSA, uh, Island uh, Oil Spill Association, or, or so, anyways, they, um, they kind of went through a little glitch here, and they're just now getting back up and running. They got a new board, and they're, they're re, uh, reconfiguring their board and their organization, and they will give... The, they had to cancel all of their trainings. They were giving oil spill trainings over on Orcas and San Juan Island this spring, which they canceled. But I would contact them, get on a waiting list, and generally these are free. And you can go over there and get oil spill wildlife training with them. And then of course, if you're interested in volunteering with us, like I said, we were gonna give a train, we were gonna give a training last Saturday. We uh, were gonna give it in April, then we switched it to June and then we just canceled it for June and we're not going to give one this year because I don't send untrained responders out without a trained responder for the first call or two and because of the social distancing we're just not comfortable to do a training we probably won't do a training until next winter but we will be posting it on our website and hopefully maybe we'll it's so hard to plan anything with this COVID going on as everybody knows we don't know where it's going yet, so. Okay, we have another question from Ivana. And Ivana, if you'd like, you can also turn off your mic. Um, but Ivana, or turn on, sorry. Yeah, um, is there any yourself, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the question is, is there any work with Canada to decrease the amount of entanglements among marine mammals? Have we talked with them about the UME of gray whales? Oh yeah, we work with Canada on the UME. NOAA and, and, and Department of Fisheries and Oceans, yes, they work together on the UME, totally. Yeah, that, and also with any authorities in Mexico. Oh yeah, because this, this, is, a, this is a whole West Coast wide, yeah, it, uh, totally working with DFO and, and the Mexican side too, yeah. Great. Um, this is more of a comment. I thought it was super interesting about the whale earwax getting sent to Baylor. I didn't even know that whales had earwax or that it like had that yeah. much information. Kind of yeah. like the rings on the tree, how it tells you like if it's going through stress. Exactly. Um, and, and it's laid down in six month increments from the top from birth. Yeah. And it's just, it just, it is, to, it has a wealth of information in it. Yeah, I did have a question about, um, the, the kind of rehab process, and it seems like there's this, I don't know, this process. So if it's too young, if it's a Lanugo pup and it's too young, then it doesn't get, and it's not close to weaned, then it doesn't get sent to rehab. No, okay. The, or doesn't this, get sent to rehab. Let me explain something. In Oregon and Washington, we don't have a lot of rehab centers, um, and each individual seal is determined from NOAA whether it's a candidate for rehab. They don't like to rehab all seal pups. It's just the policy that it is with Oregon and Washington. It's, it's just the way it is. Um, when we have people who come from British Columbia or from California, in California and in British Columbia, all seal pups are candidates for rehab, okay? So they're all, even Lanugos sometimes. And so in Canada and in California, they're all sent to, um, they're all sent to uh, rehabilitation centers. Um, they've got great big ones in California, down in La Jolla and San Pedro, and also um, in Sausalito. And of course, BC has the Vancouver Aquarium, which um, 
part, a big part of the Vancouver Aquarium is a rehab, totally rehab with vets and everything. We do not have that option in Oregon and Washington. It's just not the policy of NOAA. And so that's, we have to live with that and we have to deal with how it is there. So a Lanugo pup is not considered a candidate for rehab because they're prob it's pro the success rate of it being released and living in the wild is not as high. So because we only have a few pups that we are allowed to send to rehab, the ones that they want sent to rehab and go through a full three to four month rehab, they wanna make sure that they're gonna ensure that they can be released and live in the wild for a long life. Do we have any more questions? Um, I also have another question, and maybe this is like really obvious, but maybe folks don't know. Um, how can we tell if a mammal is stranded versus just, you know, chilling? Like, what are what are some of the signs oh. that it's stranded? Uh, well, harbor seals, of course, they have to haul out of the water every four to six hours, or they get hypothermic. Uh, stellar sea lions, California sea lions, they like to haul out of the water and get warm. So to see one on the beach is not uncommon. Now, if you were to see it way up like the Nooksack River, that is not going to be common. Um, if you see one that is bleeding or looks very skin, skinny or is not reacting when people get near it, then it's probably sick. It probably needs care. Um, call us. We will, we will send somebody out to determine it and assess the situation. Um, obviously with a porpoise, now if it's in the water and struggling or in shallow water struggling, and we get a lot of calls of that, um, like the white rock area where the mudflats go way out. Sometimes the porpoise come in there to following a, a school of fish or something, they get stranded if the tide's going out fast and they're on the mudflats, well, that's a stranding. Uh, we, uh, uh, because of the, uh, Point Whitehorn re reserved by the time we get there and get down there, depending on what the tide is doing, if the tide's coming in, we, we don't bother because we know that the, the tide's going to re get that porpoise back out. If it's, if we know the tide's going out and it's stranded, we'll come in, we'll deal with it. Keep towels on it, try to get it back in the water. We do not want the public to try and do that because sometimes if a uh, porpoise is stranded, there's a reason it's stranded. You don't want to just push it back out into the water without looking at it and assessing the situation. We have another question from Ivana. Um, in 2018 to 2019, there was about a dozen harbor seals illegally shot and washed up in West Seattle. Um, were people caught and fined for this? Is there a place I can stay updated on this news? Um, well, no, there is not a place that you're going to find updates on that. Once it gets into enforcement, even with me and um, the bullets that I turn over to NOAA enforcement, it all gets sent to NOAA. Um, any bullet gets sent to NOAA somewhere in Seattle, they have a vault full of bullets that I've given them along with every other stranding network. Once it gets into a situation where it's going to court, they don't discuss it with us. It becomes, you know, uh, you know, whatever it is, it's, it becomes a court case and, and then it's not open for discussion. They don't share it with us. Uh, every now and then We'll hear of somebody like um, who might get caught like in Oregon last year, they caught some guy. Well, we knew about it because they, they were able to prosecute him and send him to jail for 30 days. But uh, for the most part, once it gets into the enforcement, we, we don't really hear what goes on. Thank you. Um, I do just want to flag that it is six o'clock, so I just want to see if we have any remaining questions. And it looks like we are probably good on questions. So, um, yeah, thank you again, Victoria, for your time. This has been really great, and I feel like I learned a lot, and um, yeah. Oh, thank you, Destiny. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for, for being here. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So this is going to be recorded, and this will be up on our resources YouTube page. So for anybody who missed it, they can come back and see this. But thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, everybody, um, have a good evening. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Have, a, have a good evening.